Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rebecca Bunting. I'm the Vice Chancellor of this wonderful university. And I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here this evening. And we've also got about 150 or more people joining us online. So welcome to all of you. Very warm welcome. The interest in this evening's event has been overwhelming, which I think is testimony to the popularity and esteem of our guest this evening, Luton Town legend Mick Harford. Now Mick is the chief, I don't need to tell you this because you know more about him than I do, but I am going to just say a little bit about, about him and his, his, uh, his profile. He is the chief recruitment officer of Luton Town Football Club, first joined Luton Town in 1984 as a player and stayed with the club for six years before moving to a number of other clubs, including Chelsea, Sunderland, Wimbledon, later returning to Luton in 1991 for a second spell as a player. During his football career, Mick competed in over 500 professional games and was capped twice for his country, making his England international debut in 1988. And then when his playing career came to an end, Mick returned to Luton, <coughs> first as a coach, then as director of football, before finally taking the reins as a manager. And it was as manager that he led the club to glory in the Johnston's Paint Trophy in 2009, which I'm sure some of you were probably even there, um, and is still considered a historic victory for the Hatters to this day. In 2019, so getting closer to today, when Mike returned as interim, sorry, Mike returned as interim manager of the club, he steered the team to promotion as League One champions completing an unbeaten run of 28 games, a club record, and winning him the title of Manager of the Year from the League Managers Association. Today, as the club's chief recruitment officer, Mick is enjoying the success the club continues to achieve, and isn't it fantastic how they're doing? Luton Town's remarkable promotion to the Premier League and the construction of the new stadium at Power Court will without doubt contribute significantly to the Luton 2040 vision, shining a spotlight on our wonderful town and ushering in an era of growth and revitalization. At the university, we're particularly delighted to be the official education partner of the club, and we really look forward to working further on opportunities and projects. Now, this evening's session is quite informal, not a formal kind of lecture as such, Mickey's going to say a little bit at the start, and then we have a panel of students who will be um, interviewing him, asking questions, and after that, uh, a Q&A for the audience. So our panel today comprises John Boyle, who is <laughs> senior lecturer in communications here at the university, Fleur O'Brien, gone the wrong way, um, a student who is studying media, marketing, and PR, Amia Clark, another student who's studying journalism, and Rob Clark, no relative, <laughs> yeah, yeah. radio lab manager, and a graduate of the university in sports journalism. So please now give a really warm welcome to our guest for the evening, Mick Harford. <laughs> This, is, this makes me really nervous. Uh, it's not something I do. Uh, and it's, it's a bit like making my debut for Luton again. This is uh, all those years ago, uh, years ago which, was, which was at Leicester City. Uh, and we drew two each. But it, it's an honour and a privilege to be here at the University of Bedfordshire. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, I haven't prepared anything. Uh, so it's, uh, nothing can go wrong, basically. Uh, but I, I will give you a brief overview of my, of my career, what, what, where I've been, the clubs, the, the managers I've had and the experience I've had, just in, in a 10-minute conversation. You know, my, uh, my early life was I was born in Sunderland, uh, into a family of seven. I've got three sisters and a brother, uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic upbringing I had as a young kid. Went to a school called St. Cuthbert's, a Catholic boy. A good Catholic boy, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we had a teacher called Mr. McAuliffe, 
Mr. McAuliffe was an Irishman, a uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic teacher. Every play, every playtime, lunchtime, playtime, he would take us out and coach us football. Uh, there'd be myself, and through that school came Mickey Hazard, who, who's a wonderful footballer, Kevin Dillon and myself. I'll never forget Mr. McAuliffe pulled me one day and he said, if you don't stay for school dinners, you won't be in the football team. So I had to get used to school dinners uh, when I was a young kid. And they, they, were, they were my formative years as a footballer. I then joined a youth club and played for pub teams on a Saturday and a Sunday, playing three, three, four times over the weekend. Then I joined a club called Lampton Street Boys Club, which had some really good players, and some of them went on to be professional footballers. A friend of mine called Norman Alder, who was, a, uh, who was the manager of the football team, he, uh, he was... Uh, he never got paid, he, he, just, he just wanted to help us kids and, and go on. And he had a friend who played for Lincoln City, and this is how, this is how lucky it can be, or unlucky it can be. He had a friend called Alan Harding who played for Lincoln City, and Norman rang Alan and he said, look, we've got some, we've got some half-decent players here at this uh, youth club. Do you want to come up? And in, within three to four weeks, Graham Taylor came up. I know you don't like Graham Taylor, but <laughs> God, God rest his soul. Graham Taylor was then the manager of Lincoln. He came up, had a look at us, and he signed four of us. Four of us for Lincoln. Myself, a guy called Alan Eden, Keith Laybourne, who, God rest his soul, is not around anymore, and a guy called Mickey Smith, who went on to have a good career playing for Wimbledon and uh, Hartlepool. Alan Eden, he, he, he called it a day. He missed his girlfriend too much, and he just, want, <laughs> he just wanted to go home all the time. But that, that was the start of my career. That was, a, that was at Lincoln, and, and Lincoln was a... I think it was a massive, massive learning curve for me. I had four years there. I played with some great senior players there. Absolutely fantastic senior players who, who, who guided you, really. You know, and, and, I, and if people say to me about a young player coming into football, what's the best bit of advice you give to a young player? And the best bit of advice I would ever give to a young player is listen to the senior players, the players who have experienced it, the players who have done it, and the players who, who will want to pass on their knowledge to you. Uh, there's some bad senior players and there's some good senior players, but you, you've got to be clever enough to pick which ones are the right ones are. Uh, and the majority of those players who, who I learned off actually left Lincoln and went to Watford under Graham Taylor and, and their team went on and did very well. Uh, the next thing that happened to me was about after three and a half years at Lincoln, I got transferred to Newcastle. Uh, it, was a, it was a big move for me. It was the biggest fee in the fourth division, 180,000. Uh, and I was going to wear the number nine shirt at Newcastle, which, was a, which became a big burden for me. It was a massive burden. And I was, I was 20, 21. And I really, really struggled. Uh, really struggled. I played 18 games for Newcastle. I scored four goals. And at the end of the season, the manager, manager was Arthur Cox. Now, Arthur Cox is the only manager never to be sacked because the fans would never seen Cox out. Sorry. <laughs> hey. 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 Sorry about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> but, it, but it was a learning experience for me, and I, I, I left Newcastle and I went to Bristol City. And Roy Hodgson, believe it or not, was the manager at Bristol City. And I, I, went, I went there and I said, that will never happen to me again. I'll never be intimidated by the fans or the crowd. Unfortunately, it, it, it never occurred again. But I remember training there uh, one day, and Roy, we do, it was a Thursday or Friday afternoon, and we were doing some, some set pieces. And we, we were taking corners, and I've gone in and whacked the goalkeeper. And he said, oh, Mick, you can't do that. I said, Roy, if I don't do that today, I won't do it on Saturday. And he went, OK, no problem. <laughs> so that was, a, that, was a, uh, that was a big learning curve for me, leaving, leaving uh, Newcastle and going to Bristol City. Then after Bristol City, I only had one season there. I did very well, and we played, we played Birmingham in the... Uh, sorry, we played Aston Villa in the FA Cup in the third round of the FA Cup, and we lost 1-0, and I played quite well. Ron Saunders was then the manager of Aston Villa. Uh, he left and went to Birmingham, then he signed me at Birmingham, uh, and I really, really enjoyed my time <coughs> under, under Ron. Ron guided me. He was a, he was a bit of a tough nut. He taught me how to play centre-forward. He taught me how to look after myself uh, in terms of getting roughed up as a, as a young boy as a, against the uh, against centre-halves that you were going to face. He'd give me, 
he'll give me great information about the centre half you were you were playing, or he'll come on that side, he'll he'll challenge you on that side, and all all, all the all the experience you you need as a young player. So I had three or four years at Birmingham, met some real good people. Best friend there, Tony Coulton, is uh, still my best mate now there, ex goalkeeper. So we uh, we 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 as you go along, you, you meet you meet uh, you meet numerous people and great friends and. Uh, and, and Tony's been a friend of mine for, for over 30 years now, so it's uh, something, come, something good come out of going to Birmingham. So <laughs> then, then, I, then I signed for Luton, uh, and it was a real strange one because it was totally out of the blue. Birmingham needed some money. I think it was about 150 grand. I just had a, I'd, had, I'd had a bit of a problem uh, where I got a whack in the lip, and, and the, the manager wasn't really having me at the time, so I, I said, well, I'll get an opportunity to go to Luton. And I'll never, never forget, I walked in the dressing room there, and you look around the dressing room and it's full of internationals. And you think, well, why, why, why are they not where we were second or third or bottom? Or what they're doing down the bottom of the league? What, what's this? You've got Steve Foster, Archie Grimes, Mal Donaghy, uh, Mitchell Thomas, Tim Brick, who played for the 21s. Uh, lots and lots of fantastic footballers uh, with loads of experience. Then I think there was a masterstroke done by, uh, by, by the chairman, David Evans. He, he brought Peter Nicholas, obviously myself, and Steve Foster put a bit of a spine in the team. The team was always an exciting football team, Luton. Always played good football. Whenever you played against them, uh, you, knew, you knew what was coming, and it was really tough to play against. We wanted to keep that. We wanted to keep that uh, identity that we had as a football team, but we just needed to have a bit of strength and a bit of power which has brought on with Peter Nix, myself and, and Fuzzy. Then, then things start happening. We start winning 1-0 or drawing 0-0. We go to Liverpool and get a draw. Or we'd, we'd play Everton now and we beat them 1-0. And we start keeping clean sheets and we start to evolve. And, you know, it, it was exciting uh, because we were, we were beating these teams now. But it just goes to show the, the, the manager had, had, had a good look at what he needed and he, and he brought in some experience and some, and some pace and power. Well, not pace for me, but a bit of power, yeah. <laughs> so uh, no, after after uh, after Luton, it was a it was a absolutely the best time of my career. It was a, an unbelievable time, an unbelievable experience. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my career at at, uh, at Luton, obviously, uh, and it was, I had the opportunity to play for England, uh, playing for Luton, and I all I always I always in, I'm always in gratitude to Luton Town Football Club for that. And I'm always in gratitude to the people of Luton Town, uh, of Luton as a town itself. You know, my son was born. My son was born in the town. You know, and my son was born in the L and D. So I've got a real affiliation for for the for the football club. I've got a real affiliation for for the public because you you guys have been fantastic to me, not just as a footballer but as a person. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for support you've given me over the last few years. After, after Luton, I went to Derby, came back I I briefly, went to Derby, had a couple of years there. Arthur Cox was manager again, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, then went off to Chelsea, Sunderland, Coventry, and I ended my career at uh, Wimbledon, uh, which was a game which was, a, was an absolutely brilliant experience, a uh, fantastic experience. Played with some great players, great manager, Joe Kinnear, probably one of the best managers I ever played with. Uh, and Joe, Joe gave me an opportunity to go into coaching. I'd retired, I'd, I'd played my last game against uh, West uh, Aston Villa. We lost 1 0 at home. Achilles was struggling, and he, he said, Mick, end of the season, you take over the under 21s. And, and it was a brilliant opportunity for me to move into coaching. So, again, I'm very, very thankful and, again, very, very lucky to, to, to have had that opportunity. Uh, and Joe, Joe was a. Joe was a He's an inspiration for me, Joe Kinnear. Inspiration. Uh, and I hope he's going to be all right. He's not great at the moment, Joe, but he'll be all right. Uh, and and it's, it's a really... I, I thought this room tonight was going to be full of uh, students. I really <laughs> did, yeah. I did, yeah. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wrote this script, and I, I, I wrote this little ditto, but uh, hopefully it'll work. And it's, 
And it, it, it applies to everyone. It applies to everyone who, who has a career. And, and I, I just want to say, my, my career is no different to what you do. My career, what I did in football, is, is absolutely no different to what, what you do or, or what we're all trying to achieve. We all have our goals. Uh, we, we all have to have something to aim for, whatever business you're in, whatever you do, whatever you want to do. We all have those goals, and it's, it's no different as a footballer. No, as, a, as a footballer, it, like when, you, when you're trying to build a business, it doesn't happen overnight. As a footballer, it doesn't happen overnight. When you get to 18, you sign the forms and all that, you know, and everyone thinks, oh, well, he's, he's a professional footballer. Absolutely no way. I mean, there's, there's years ahead of learning and, and, and practicing and, and training, and, and it, it takes years to become a, 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 a consistent professional footballer, just like you guys, whatever you've done in your careers, it, it takes you a long, long time, and it, it just doesn't happen overnight. And it's, uh, and it's for me, for me, trying to, to get to that pinnacle of your career, which was, in my opinion, playing for England, it, it's small steps on a daily basis, working hard, uh, working hard, and, and, and learning, and, and being consistent in all you do, uh, and, and, and work, work differently sometimes. Sometimes you have to think differently. Sometimes you have to work together. You, know, you can't do it on your own. You have to work with people, people on the outside, people on the inside. You know, you, 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 it's just, it's just a, and, it, and it's, and it's just been for me the biggest, the biggest thing is it's been respectful and being honest with yourself uh, to, 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 to reach uh, somewhere what you, where you want to, where you want to get to. And I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about you guys. But the biggest thing is, no one gets anywhere without any hard work, and it, that, that's the crux of the matter. And that is whichever football club I've been at down the years, and still is now. When Rob will stand here and talk in front of the, the lads this morning, and he's got them, he's got them eating out the palm of his hands. The, the bottom line is, we work effing hard, you know. We work hard. We, we work harder than the opposition. So that, that's still the same message that gets sent out, sent out to every football club, to every player, and. Uh, you know, as a, as a footballer, you, you'll feel on top of the world some days. Sometimes you, you think the world's on your shoulders. Like I said to you earlier about being at Newcastle, I, I thought there was no way out for me. I thought there was no way out. I thought this is the end of my career. But you have to be resilient. You have to bounce back. And it's just like if you guys, whatever business you're in, if you you're going to have setbacks, you're going to you're going to get uh, you're going to have bad days and, 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 and good days. And it's uh, enjoy enjoy the good days. But when you're having bad days, just remember the good days and how hard you have to work to get back to those good days. Uh, so whatever business you're in, whatever you do in your life, uh, my message is stay strong, be yourself, and go for it. Yeah? Thank you. Thanks for that, Mick, and hopefully these guys have taken on board some of that, the sports shirts yeah, yeah. and students, and yeah, I'll be looking forward to seeing that hard work next week, guys, in class. <laughs> um, okay, <coughs> so we'll start off with a, a few questions from the panel, and then we'll throw it out open to you guys, because I'm sure a lot of you have got questions that you want to ask Mick yourself. Um, Mick, it's interesting hearing there you talking about when you first went to Luton and the way they play, they played good football, but they were struggling down the bottom of the league with good players. Do you see a lot of similarities between that team that you joined and the one now that Rob's building, the way we're starting to dominate possession in games? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I really believe so. Uh, we, we're evolving very, very quickly at uh, the start of the season. I think it was a, I think it was a learning curve. I think, I think we have to take our, our, our hat off to Rob, you know, and, uh, and his coaching staff because I spoke to them the other day and asked them, how did all this evolve? And if you watch us play now, we, we're so brave, we're so strong, we, we're so brave in the... In the tactics he uses, uh, you know we go man for man, and you, know, you, you you watch you watch the TV or go to the game. If there's if if there's three strikers up the top end of the pitch, you've always got four there. But we, we don't do that anymore. We go man for man, and that's that's brave and that's strong. And what what it does to the football team, and it, it doesn't take and it just simplifies things. It simplifies what your role is, what your job is, and it's actually it's been a. For me, it's been a bit of a masterstroke what, what he's done. So, hopefully, he will carry on doing that. I think the fans really enjoy the way we play. 
I think we like, we like obviously being Luton people, we like to be positive, we like to go after teams, and I think the play in that way is, is, is exactly what he's, he's had in mind. You know, he, he's, uh, he's, 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 got it, he's got it right. He's got it right. There's going to be ups and going to be downs, like we spoke about earlier, but, uh, but just at the moment, he's, uh, he's got things ticking along over nicely, yeah. And you wouldn't have been able to play that way if you hadn't recruited the way you have. Obviously, you're ch chief recruitment officer now. Yeah. These three centre backs you've got are rapid. All three of them, aren't they? At the minute, you've got Bell, Mengi, and Osho. And even when Burke comes in, he's no slouch. Is that kind of helping you play this style of football? Well, we're a proper football club, and the manager decides who comes in at the end of the day. It's not one of these technical directors or whatever. The manager has the final say, which is, in my opinion, the the only way to manage a football club. We, we recruited for pace, power, strength. That's what he asked us to bring in. And we, we believe we did that with, with the likes of Osh uh, Gabe, with Berkey, with Ted Mengi, with Ogbeni, Alfie Doughty, Chongi, uh, Brown. They've all got pace, they've all got energy, and they can all get around the pitch. And uh, Rob, Rob worked in on, on with the players, and he found a way of putting this uh, recruitment plan into a certain set of tactics and at the moment he's got it spot on yeah mm. and just last question from me then before i get on to these guys uh, the, the january signings so you've branched out and found a japanese international which yes, is unheard yeah. of for, for luton town yeah, yeah. can you tell us a bit about how that's come about and maybe touch on the reading boys that you've signed as well yeah we uh, we hashi was uh, one we've been looking at but we we actually never got the opportunity to go and watch him live we we went out to watch him twice and he never played I think, yeah, I think, I think. We, what, it was in Belgium, we, what, it wasn't in Hong Kong or whatever, <laughs> Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo, sorry, Tokyo, not Hong Kong. It, it, that's the next sign from Hong Kong, that one. He wasn't in Tokyo, he was, in, he was playing in Belgium there. So uh, Phil, Phil Chappell, one of our scouts, went to watch him, and he never played, he was injured, and I think the second time we went to have a look at him, uh, he, he, was, he was actually sitting in front of Phil. But we, we did loads and loads of video work. Uh, we must have watched him over 20, 20 games of him and all that. And now he's come in as a right wing back who can play right side, centre half, who can play right back. He's very versatile. He's quick. He's got loads of energy. He speaks really, really good English. Uh, he's a real good guy. He told me today he's a good golfer, so we'll, we'll see, yeah? <laughs> but, uh, so now he's uh, it's, it's, it's a... It's a Coming into the Premier League, in terms of recruitment, it's, a, it's real tough because you know, we, we, we can't afford the players. We, we, I mean, the players you really want, you can't afford. And, and the, the thing that really hurts us the most is we're only allowed two domestic loans. So our two loans are Sambi Lakonga and Ishii Kabora. So that's all we can bring in. So, so we can't bring any more loans in. We can bring overseas loans in, but then again, it's another risk. So if we, if we were allowed to have more loans, we'd have more loans from, from English and British clubs. So it really restricts us because financially we can't compete with the other guys, but we have to, we have to compete our way, you know. And you brought in these two boys from Reading doing that, which is probably yeah. a bit cheaper than signing Premier League yeah. players. Can you tell us a bit well, about them? Yeah, Tom, Tom, was, uh, Tom was on our radar about 18 months ago. He was in the office. We had him in there when Nathan was manager. He was ready to sign, he changed his mind, he went back to Reading. If he'd have been with us now, we'd have been on a lot of money. So we, we told him that as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we told him he, he missed the boat. And I, and I actually went to watch him the other night at uh, Stephen V Reading, but he's injured, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. uh, the other boys are forward. Uh, Gary, our CEO, we all know very well, uh, loves, loves a punt. Loves a punt and a young centre forward. Uh, down the years, we've taken punts on, for instance, Isaac Vassell, for instance, one or two of the younger ones, uh, Bim Pedal. They don't all work, work out. I mean, uh, they don't all work out, uh, work out, but we always believe someone always wants to centre forward. Someone is always looking for centre forward. So we, we, take, we take little punts on someone, and we, I spent a little, I think it was about 300 grand on him. Uh, he's quick, he's lively, and he, he's, got, he's got a chance, yeah. And if... Uh, he, he, he's, he's injured as well, believe it or not. <laughs> they come here and they get injured, yeah. I think the training's too hard for them, mate. Yeah. Yeah, they work them too hard. So, uh, so no, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be an asset and he'll probably go out on loan in the next window, yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks for that. So we're going to have a question from each of these guys, and yes. then we're going to throw it open to the audience. So yeah, Flo, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, what is the youngest player that is currently on your radio, radar for potential future signings? Uh, that's a really good question, but we, we, we actually had a recruit Thursday is our recruitment meeting. We always we have a long day Thursday. Uh, we get together, we, 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 we throw a load of names around, we look at we, we get together, we all watch the videos, myself and all the uh, and all the recruitment team. Gary comes along occasionally, Rob pops his head in and out, which is brilliant. Uh, you know, he's supporting us. And we look at a couple of young players today, funny enough, one from Stoke City is a centre forward. And uh, but we we can't really give names out here because of, but we are we are looking we we we're happy with the squad uh, but there's a young 18 year old lad at Stoke who's come on our radar centre forward played in the first team and uh, yeah so following up on Flo's question so you'll start about 18 years old you don't start looking through the kind of no no we watch under 15 games yeah. for example yeah occasionally occasionally if if we need if if like Lee Cowley or. Our scout and head of our scouting department in the academy. If he says, Mick, can you go and watch this kid? Have a look. Give me, give me an idea what you think. We, we do that, yeah. And all the under 18 teams that come to the brace and we watch them play, we, we keep an eye on them, keep an eye on the opposition. So we, we <coughs> recruit all the way down, all the way down, even to the under nine, under eight and number nines. So, yeah, we, we uh, recruit very deep. Thank you. Well, my boys, eh? Oh. I'll get you to come and watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, not another dad. <laughs> <laughs> if he's as tall as you, he's on the books. Trust me. <laughs> uh, That'll be the only clip uh, they put out. <laughs> uh, Amir, you got a question? Yeah. Uh, as you began making a name for yourself, how did you adjust to the fame and the popularity that came alongside this? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question because, I mean, you... Uh, I wouldn't say fame. I think when you when you're in your your formative years, it's all about. It's not about the fame. It's it's about wanting to get into the first team. And it's really really bizarre. And I, I don't. I'm I'm not I'm not. Uh, I've, I've, it's it's really weird because it's. I'm probably more famous now than I've ever been. So it's, <laughs> it's, really, it's really strange, and maybe that's because of what's happened to me over the last two or three years and all that now. And I'm really really grateful for that. And and, and the support I've had, as I said earlier. It's been un unbelievable, and I, I can't. I sometimes can't get my head around it. Uh, f fame, fame is uh, fame is can be a good tool, you know, for yourself, but it can also be dangerous, you know, when you look at players. But I think I think the the era that I played in, there was, there was fame, but I wasn't I wasn't famous. But I think nowadays, if you have fame and money, and it becomes a dangerous it's a, it's a dangerous uh, uh, combination, that is. But I was famous, but I didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so now it's uh, I, I don't know. I'm I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to answer that one. But it's it, it's quite nice when I mean when people ask for your autograph. It's quite nice when people ask for a photograph, and you feel quite honoured and humble in all fairness. Uh, so, so now it's, it's I, I quite enjoy it and. Uh, I, w I just want to give something back, you know. People have been really good to me, and I want to give something back. Thank you. He definitely was famous. I had a picture of him on my wall growing up. <laughs> he was famous in my house, in the 1992 kit. Yeah. Well, it was really yeah, weird. It was really weird about about nine months ago. I was at the hospital, and uh, my my uh, consultant, Mr. Lynch, and uh, he's come running out. He's come running out, and all I said. I see and all that, and he said, uh, he said, oh, are you? He said, uh, he said, I saw you on Newsnight last night. I said, what, me on Newsnight? He went, yeah, there was a guy on. I don't know if you know Olafal Afal with the beard. He's a massive big Luton fan. Well, he was on, he was on, uh, on Newsnight getting interviewed, and there was a picture of me behind him. <laughs> there was a picture on the wall behind him, and he went, I saw you on Newsnight. I like, oh, no. I said, that's the only time I'll ever get a news night. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's probably a couple of people here, Mick, that don't know necessarily that story about the work you're doing for prostate cancer and the reasons why and things. Do you just want to touch on it now so we, we cover it tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I was obviously diagnosed in uh, 2020 with, with uh, prostate cancer. And uh, myself, Gary and Nathan, we sat down together. And 
as a football club myself, I, I just thought I used to I used to sit there and watch the games, and I thought I wonder how many people in here got prostate cancer. And I wonder, I thought if I could just help one person, one person, that would do for me. So Gary, myself, and Nathan uh, put the word out there, and it's uh, we just try to help as many people as we can. Uh, get the word out there. Uh, give information. I'm, I'm part of a few groups now which I really, really enjoy and just go and, and have little chats and stuff with the people there and if there's any remote uh, uh, what's the word, testing places which you've had a kennel on the throat, I'll go down and say hello to the guys who are getting tested and, and just give them support really, just give them support because it's, uh, it's something I'm uh, really, really big into yeah, and trying to help as many people as I can. Yeah. I, I don't think I'll be the only one. Me and my dad went and got tested after you. I think okay. a lot of Hatters fans did, didn't they? Oh, that's great. great you, yeah. you hear it a lot yeah. around among Luton fans, yeah. so thanks for what you've done. No, no, no problem. Um, okay, on to Rob. Yeah, I, I, I want to go back to your career in the 90s, and I've got like a quote from Ferguson in the 91-92 season where Manu didn't win the league, and Ferguson said... He regretted not signing you. He said you, you would have made a pivotal impact if he signed you. Were you aware of that? And if so, what would you make of one of the best managers in the history of the game say that about you? He knows a good player, doesn't he? He yeah. does, he does. I'll, I'll yeah. give him that. Yeah. Uh, he, he's got an eye for a player that further. <laughs> what, what was his name again? Ooh, I, <laughs> Uh, uh, were, you, were you thinking of making the move to Man no, I, I ever, never, ever? I, I, it came out, Alex, Alex Ferguson wrote a book, uh, and it, it came out in the book, and I, I never knew anything till then, oh, uh, but, but then I spoke to Pleaty, and, and Pleaty said, oh, he never rang me, I said, that was talk, talk shit. <laughs> I, I still speak to Pleaty, he said, oh, he never rang me, he never contacted me, I said, don't give me all that. <laughs> uh, but I, I never, if it, if it was today, the, I would have heard first. The player, if I knew, and he was my agent, who would have rang the agent, they wouldn't have gone. Years ago, it was manager to manager. That's the way it was years ago. And the player never heard anything. I mean, but then the manager would then ring, ring an agent up. The agent would tell me, and, and then you've gone. You know, you've gone. Because you just go in and say, I'm, I'm off. I mean, I'm going. You, you, you can't. It's an easy thing to say, but you, and as much as I love Luton, if, if an opportunity to go and play for Manchester United comes along, you, I'm afraid you, you you can't turn that down, you know, and playing for Sir Alex. Sure, sure. So no, I, I never heard a thing about it until Sir Alex books come out, yeah. Oh, wow. So you would have gone as well, like you said. You would have been off to Manchester. <laughs> no, I'd stay the league. <laughs> 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 right, trying to get me into trouble, aren't you? Yeah, no, no, I'm, I just thought, I just thought... You I won't didn't... like me anymore, right? <laughs> I, I won't get you kicked out, I promise. Right. You're out of order, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> He's left our course. Uh, 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 <laughs> trust me, I'm not a nobody. Honestly, I, I am associated with this university. I'm not here by accident, I promise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK, so are Kyle and Lauren about with the microphones? Right, let's start taking some questions from the audience. Should we, who, who's keener? You are, you're first up. OK, let's go to uh, Kyle then. Uh, put your hand up if you've got a question and... Uh, wait for you to ask it. Uh, you mentioned about the recruitment, but one player you haven't mentioned was Ross Barkley, who's been a sensation this year, but it came out of nowhere, that sign-in. How did that come about? You're, you're dead right, it came out of nowhere. He was he presented to us by his agent. Uh, his agency is Wasserman, probably the biggest agency in the country, along with Stella and uh, USM. Uh, and this was Rob's doing. This was Rob's doing. Rob... Uh, Spoke to his agent, a guy called Paul Martin, and uh, Rob said to us, he said, we've got an opportunity to sign Ross Bartley. What's your thoughts? He said, he asked us, when obviously Ross Bartley, uh, if, he, if he's in a good place, well, it's, it's some, someone you couldn't turn down. And I'll be, in all honesty, Rob really instigated it. Rob wanted to do it. Rob took it upon his own, own methods to do it. So basically, it was down to Rob. Now, we... Anyone can scout Ross Barkley. Anyone knows Ross Barkley. He's a good player. He's got 33 England caps. But he, he Rob, it was, a, it was a big decision because uh, of the, the finances and stuff. It was a big call. Uh, he was making a big choice. And he, and he, at the moment, he's got it absolutely spot on. And well done, Rob, yeah. 
Okay, another question on this side then. I'm well, not taking any credit for that one. Let's see how much we can make Kyle run <laughs> up and down these stairs. Mick, I remember going to the baseball ground and you scored one of the most important goals for Luton. Did you actually mean it? <laughs> I'm sure it was a kennel with Rose, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. You were actually wearing a white shirt that day. Yeah, I remember that goal. I, rem I remember it. And I also, the season before, I missed the right sitter playing for Derby against Luton. And I think you beat us 2 1 when, when Tim Breakers smacked one in the top corner. But that, um, I, I remember that clearly, uh, the own goal, uh, which Jay... Did you mean it? Of course I meant it. <laughs> hey. I mean it. <laughs> I think Shilton was getting towards the end of his career then, wasn't he? Yeah, J Jason Reese. remember Jason Reese? Jason Reese whipped the free kick in from the corner and I've gone up to edit, it skimmed off the top of my head and, and gone intensely into the top corner. <laughs> and Sh uh, Shilton was in goal, he, he'd finished by then. He, he, I mean, you, you couldn't get a fag paper under his boots, Shilton. <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he, he couldn't get off the floor, he couldn't. So uh, I'm surprised it was only 1-0. <laughs> and was the next game you played for Luton, back at Luton? Was it? That was Derby, wasn't it? And then you re-signed for Luton straight after that. Uh, phew, I moved around that much, I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm really not sure. Yeah, I believe you did. Was it? Yeah, yeah. I believe you did, yeah. Because Derby got relegated and Luton stayed up. And you I did, yeah, you yeah. yeah, yeah. To I did, better yeah. team, obviously. I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's have a question from this side, side then. So, uh, yeah, Lauren, do you want to pick someone? Has anyone got a question? come here to kind of like see um, what this is all about. Um, my main question is, what piece of advice would you give to someone who's facing a hurdle, particularly younger children or people who, you know, the little boys that always go, I want to play football when I'm older, or the little girls that go, I want to play football, but my mum says that only boys can play football. What is your advice for those who are facing those hurdles? I think... I think uh uh, those hurdles are really tough, and I think each and every one of us have faced those hurdles in, a, in our lifetime in this room. Uh, and I think we all do things differently. Uh, I could say something, and, and people might say, well, I wouldn't have done that, I'd have done that differently, but I can only speak for myself. And the advice I give to you is, or someone who is, 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 is obviously communicate with people, make sure you communicate with people, don't, don't keep it a secret because it just it just gets worse and worse and it all festers uh, and, and things become ten times worse when you do that and you, you just don't think there's any way out. And I think, I think the best person to share it with is, is your mother or your father. Okay, another question from that side. There's one in front here. Tom Rock here. Will yes. he pay for Luton again? We, we sincerely hope so. We, we're praying and hoping he's going to make a comeback. But Tom now has a six month break. He won't do anything for six months. Uh, and we'll just see how he is. We, I'll be perfectly honest with you, we haven't really spoke about it. We've just let him recover, let him get better. He's been in a couple of times uh, to, to see everyone. He's in a good place. And uh, we just hope and pray that one day he, he will put his boots back on again. Uh, but if, if, if there's any possibility of him not being what he was or what he can be, I don't think, he'll, I don't think we'd ever put him at risk. As a football club, we, we couldn't do that. But we just hope and pray that he, he does play again, yeah. But he's in a good place. He's in a good place. He's learning Spanish now. <laughs> Yeah, Nathan Jones is teaching him, teach him how to speak Spanish. <laughs> he is, honestly, that's the truth, yeah. <laughs> si, senor. <laughs> and there was a nice moment this week, wasn't there? Didn't you present him with yes. the Premier League? Yes, yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk to them a bit about that, what that ceremony was all about, who came along? Well, John, uh, we, we had a... The club is, is absolutely fantastic at being inventive and 
innovative and stuff and all that, you know. And we decided to present all the lads who had, who had uh, made their Premier League debuts this season. And we brought the legend in, John Still. And John, John, is a, John is the nicest guy you could ever wish to meet. He came along and myself and John give the, give the, the balls to, to the relevant players. And it was really fitting that uh, the last presentation was John when he gave it to Pelly, because John obviously signed Pelly. So Tom got his first and Pelly got his last. So really, really, really good day at the football club. And Tom was there, which made it even better. Yeah, OK, another question. Which division is Luton going to be in next season? <laughs> uh, as, we, as we look at it at the moment on form, we'll, we'll be a Premier League club, yeah. And we, we, myself and all the staff believe so. Uh, as I said earlier, as a, as, a, as a team, we're evolving. We're getting better. Uh, I think, I think we, we did improve it. We obviously lost Ryan Giles. He went off to all. And we, we improved it again with maybe strengthening it a little bit, maybe giving us a bit more of a defensive platform with Hashi coming in. So we believe we're stronger. Uh, the manager believes in the players so much. He's got so much faith in them. And the players believe in the manager so much. The faith and the togetherness that's there, uh, the camaraderie, the spirit. Uh, if it goes on that, we, we'll win the league, you know? But if it went on that, we, we'll, we'll definitely be staying up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain we can stay up. Never going to be easy. Uh, one target, I think, I, I've, I've given to Elijah. If he gets 15 goals, we stay up. And he's on, he's on, on course for that. So uh, we've all got targets, we've all got aims, we've all got goals. But uh, yeah, I think there's a, a massive, massive chance that we could be a Premier League team next season, yeah. OK, we've got a few pre-prepared questions that people have sent in as well. Uh, so we'll do a couple of them and then we'll get one or two from the online audience that Rosie's taken care of. Uh, Amir, do you want to read one of the, yeah, the questions sure. that's pre-submitted and tell us um, who sent it in? Ben Pearson wants to know, what's the best advice you can give to a coach who's starting out and has the dream to coach at the highest level? Good question. Uh, someone got a letter the other day, uh, very similar question. Mick, I want to be a coach and all that and now and I want to do this. Can you give me some advice? Obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's again, the... the the process of becoming a top coach is, is long and hard and, and it's tough to get, to get to the top of where you ever want to get to. But the best bit of advice I could give is, is keep it simple and be yourself. Don't try and be something you're not. Don't try and complicate things. Keep it as simple as possible. Football is a simple game. When you start trying to impress people by stupid methods and all that, you know, that's, that's when you start coming unstuck. So keep it simple and be yourself. Yeah. Alana Ward wants to know, what is your favourite memory of Luton as a player and as a manager? Oh, whoa, whoa. There's, a, there's a couple of things as a player, uh, which, which I can't really separate, to be honest with you. Obviously winning the uh, Little Woods Cup in 1988, that's the only major trophy I've ever won, and a lot of the other lads also won, and... Uh, we, we had a brilliant team. You know, the team was a brilliant, brilliant team. Some fantastic players. You, know, you look at the team. They were, they were, they were, as I said earlier, they were, we were bestowed with international footballers, you know, and there were some, some marvellous footballers. And we deserved, we deserved to win something. The, how, how, you know, we, we got to the final that year. We won. We got the final the next year. We'd lost in, in that same year. We won the Littlewoods Cup. We lost in the semi-final of the FA Cup to Wimbledon. We were so, so close, and uh, we fully deserved that. So that, that was one of the highlights of my career. Uh, playing for England was obviously a massive thing for me, and, uh, and I'm so glad I did a playing for Luton, because at the time I was probably playing the best football in my career, playing with the best players I played with uh, in my career. So, so, so being, being, uh, being in the England squad and playing for England and winning in 88 was... was was, I'd tie those two together. As a manager or a coach, uh, it's, it's a difficult one, this one, because uh, I, I'm not a coach. I'm, I'm recruitment, but I'm part of the team, I'm part of the staff. And what, what, what happened last year was remarkable, you know, and I think 
what the club achieved last year and and it, and it wasn't luck, it wasn't fortune because we were in the playoffs the season before and we deserve to be where we are, we deserve to be in the Premier League, we're a Premier League team. So, albeit I wasn't the manager or the coach, I think us getting in the Premier League and everyone at the football club making, a, making a, whatever kind of contribution it is, I think that, that, is, that is something something special for me. Okay, Rob, have you got a question? Then we'll take a couple from the online audience. Yeah, sure. So I've got one from Leslie Lelliot, and this is about what is it about Luton that kept you going back to them throughout your career? You left occasionally and always came back. What was it attracted to you, Luton in particular, mainly, mainly the place? No one else offered me a job. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I'll shop you now. Fair enough. <laughs> And, and uh, no, it's, uh, it's, I, I, the, the last time I came back, that was uh, eight, nine years ago when Nathan took over as manager. Gary, Gary rang me. Uh, Gary sacked me, believe, believe it or not. Gary sacked me uh, three or four years previously. And uh, it was the right thing to do uh, when, we, when we went into the conference because uh, we needed a specialist to get them out of the league. And I, I thought they made a great decision there. And I wasn't... I wasn't bitter, I wasn't angry, I was just I was pleased that the club had gone in a different way. Uh, so I left then and about five years later I got a call from Gary. Do you, do you know Nathan? I said, I, I don't know Nathan, but I've spoken to him on the phone a few times. Because I, I used to call Nathan quite a lot uh, because I had, a, I had admiration for him in terms of what he did at Yeovil, in terms of his recruitment when he was at Yeovil with... Uh, and he always used to sign good loan players. And I'd go, how has he got that player down there? And he used to, a bit of admiration for him. So, so I'd call, I'd ring Nathan about players and stuff. And we had a relationship. And I actually met him on holiday in Spain and Mallorca. And we had a, had a couple of nights out together. So I got to know him before I came to, to Luton. And Nathan said, uh, sorry, Nathan and Gary said, would you like to come back? And I mean, I just uh, definitely like to come back, yeah. Be part of a team and part of that. And, and again, Nathan was was really, really uh, heavily into recruitment. He, he, he's, that's a big part of his management strategy, be, being, being head of recruitment. And again, he has the last say. Uh, so that was the reason why I came back. I got an invitation from Gary. Did you find it easier when you came back? After, what do you mean? So when you, when you came back, so when you went to another club, you came back, was it quite easy to adjust into Luton life straight away? Yeah, well, I mean, Luton Luke never. Luton's the best club in the country, in terms of uh, what it what it's about and the people and the staff and the 2020 board and Gary and the chairman. It's a, it's a special place and uh, people don't get it, you know. They don't they don't get it and it's it's a, it's like a massive big family. We're all together and that, you know. And there's there's no one there's no one takes credit for anything. We're all it's all a, it's all a collective what we do and. And that, that, that's the beauty of our football club, you know, there's, there's no one sat there going, well, I did this and I did that. We all do it together, you know, and it's a, it's a, as I said, it's a, it's a collective thing. Uh, and that makes it a lot easier to come back into a football club where you, we, we don't have to prove ourselves, we just come in and do good work and that, you know, and, and if your work's good enough, then it gets approved and hopefully you, you, you make a contribution to what, to what, uh, what we're trying to aim for, as usual. Okay, we've got over 100 people watching from home. I'm not sure what the stats are, because it's set up here. But Rosie, have you got a couple of questions from the online? We audience? have. We've got some great questions coming in online at the moment. Oh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> so Darren would like to know, how have Luton managed to galvanise and gain a spirit of togetherness and a bond with fans that could potentially see Luton pull off a miracle relegation survival? Yeah, good, good question. Very good question there. Uh, I think I go to a lot of games, I watch a lot of games, maybe three, four times a week. And the, the thing that sticks out in my mind about the Luton fans is they stay till the end. No one leaves. It's absolutely brilliant. I'm sat there going, this is fantastic. I go to the stadium, I like my team, and look, uh, like quarter to five, there's half a stadium in there, you know, go, what's going on there? And, the, and, and when you go one nil down, you get louder. Then other, other, other clubs get quiet then, and that, that's... That's that's the support we know we get from you. Uh, I think I think 
because the, the board, the 2020 board, they're all fans, uh, really super intelligent fans, a lot of brains, a lot of knowledge, and obviously a few quid. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think I think that engenders a lot of spirit from from them. You know, after the Newcastle game on uh, Saturday, I and my family was at the game, and I I spoke to Paul Ballantyne, who was one of our directors. Said Paul, 6:15, I'll be in the botanist in Newcastle having a few beers. He turns up with all his family. And it's, it's it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Our, our main sponsor. <coughs> Uh, staff platform, Richard Miller, uh, Chris. I'll be in the botanist. He turns up and everyone's in there. There's a, there's a mass of togetherness and a, a big spirit and a camaraderie. And, and the manager must have to take takes a lot of credit for it, you know. The manager's, uh, the manager's uh, massively into interaction with the fans. Uh, I think he's honest, honest as the days long. And uh, I think he's very, very informative in what he tells the fans and what, what he gives to them. I've just noticed we're running out of time, so we're probably going to have to have one more from the online audience and maybe one more in here, and then anyone else who's got questions for Mick, you're going to be hanging around to have a drink. Yeah, fine, yeah, yeah. So you can ask your question to him, to the man himself in a minute. Um, so one more from you, Rosie? Yeah, one more from our online audience, <coughs> and we've got somebody who'd like to know, Mick, if you would have ever taken the chance to play or manage abroad. Yeah, uh, well, that's... I had an opportunity to go to, uh, when I was playing for Luton, to go to Marseille. Uh, when the, the time was signed, Chris Waddle and the agent, uh, I forget his name now, but he, God rest his soul, he's not around anymore. And uh, Chris rang me, he said, have you, have you, have you, I said, yeah, he rang me, Chris. I used to play with Chris at Newcastle. Uh, and I went, I went, okay, so, but then I, I was injured. I'd done my knee and I, I couldn't go anywhere, so. That was, a, uh, that was the only opportunity I've ever, ever to play abroad. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I, think, I, think it's, I think this is the best place. I love playing in England. I, love, I used to love playing in, in London, believe it or not. I love playing in London around Christmas time. Uh, the atmosphere, the fans, the, the spirit, the camaraderie. I think the level of the football in England is way ahead of any... any foreign league or whatever league you want to uh, uh, go to. So <clears throat> I wasn't really that bothered that I never played abroad. I was just quite happy to play at the highest level I could in England. Has anyone got an amazing question to finish with? It's going to have to be a good one. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go to the front here. Hi. Mick, there's some interesting stories from an end of season trip that you went on with David Evans and David Pleat. Yeah. Are you able to share those? Uh, it's before nine o'clock, so uh, <laughs> clean version, please. Yeah, we were, we were in an uh, end-of-season trip. We went to Cyprus, uh, just about five miles down from Ayanapa, and we were on this beach bar. And it was really weird, because Emmick and Noah Joby was there, I was here, David Evans was there, and David Pleat was there. So we were sat there, and sat having a few drinks, and, and behind us was the beach and the sea and all that. It was all kicking off behind and these three motorbikes pulled up in front of us. Brown, 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 brown. Three, three lads. Mitchell Thomas, Brian Steen, and Ricky Hill. <laughs> on, the, on, the, on these motorbikes, go, brown, brown, all right, boss, what are you doing? And all that, have a few beers and all that. And, I, and I'll go and have a drink and I'll have a car and drink. And anyway, they go, brown, revving it all up and all that. Where are you going now? He said, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We're going to go on the beach, we're going to go up the mountains and all that, you know. And I'm sat there listening and all that. I go, no, okay, okay. And I can see David Evans sat next to me and he's going like that. He's going, fucking, no, 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 no. So they've gone, vroom, 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 and off the go. We stood there, but off the go, whoosh, off the go. And they're going down the road and all that. The fucking smoke's coming out, the, the, <laughs> coming out the back of the engine and all that, you know. And, and David Evans has turned to plate. He was sat there and I was sat in the middle and he's gone, call yourself a manager. <laughs> call yourself a manager. That's three of our best players. That's our, that's our best three players on motorbikes. Are they insured? Please has gone. No, no, they're not, they're, they won't be insured. They won't be insured and all that. I said, well, what are you going to do about the discipline of this club is an effing disgrace. It's an absolute effing disgrace. And I could see Pleatley like going like that. He's, going, he's getting lower, he's getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And, lower. and he's, he's nailing them. He's nailing them. He must have nailed them for about five minutes. It's a disgrace. Where till I get you home and all that? And now this is going to... Anyway, not a word of a lie. He's, he's going down like that. 
And these parachutes come across, one of those paragliders. <laughs> one of those paragliders come across. And I've looked up and it was fuzzy. <laughs> and, uh, up, and, he, and he's gone, Chairman, Chairman. Hello, mate, how are you doing? All right down there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. That lady had a question up the top in the red top, yeah. Okay, uh, we got time for one more, or are we going to go on that last one? That lady, that lady had a question. I can tell she's very keen to get the question in. Thank you for a great evening. I uh, just have a quick question. If there's any players past or present that you would include in the current team, who would it be? Oh, brilliant. Top brilliant five, question. maybe. Uh, positionally, or just the best player? You choose. Uh, uh, I mean... I, 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 have a, I have a thing about the players I played with at Luton. Some, some of the players were fantastic, far better than I was. Uh, brilliant, brilliant players. My favourite ever player to play for Luton, Steve Foster. He came in, he galvanised us, he made us better. He was a brilliant captain. He wasn't the best footballer, but he, he got us together and we had a massive camaraderie in a spirit. And it reminds me so much of today's team. Uh, so I think Fozzie would, would definitely be at the top there with me as a, as a, as a captain, as a winner, as a leader. You know, Fozzie was a one-off. He never trained. He trained on a Friday morning. That was it, you know. <laughs> never trained, but you know, he had this terrible habit of going on the pitch and the ball would land on his head and all that. And now you think, how does that happen? Because he got himself in the right position all the time. Uh, he would definitely be one, one of them, but the, the, probably the one who I would pick and probably who's the best footballer since Ross Bartley is Ricky Hill. Yeah, Ricky, Ricky was, Ricky could play anywhere. Right wing, he played on the right wing, he was, he was a natural Ricky, he was the best cross of a ball on the run, he could drive through midfield, he, he, had, he had an eye for goal and he was just a, just a super footballer. So if you had Ross Bartley and Ricky Hill in there and Samby, that would be a brilliant midfield three. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a brilliant midfield three. Okay, so we'll, we'll thank Mick in a minute because we're going to have the VC wrapping up the event. I just wanted to say that um, we've got opportunities at the University of Bedfordshire to work with Luton Town now because we're in partnership with them. These guys have already been to report on the Crystal Palace game this season and Rob Edwards called them the, uh, was lucky it? Charm. his lucky charm well, because we so won the game, didn't we? See so you Saturday, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First home Premier League win. And, the, and this guy on here, we've got the, the poster behind, Jake, yeah. Jake Scott. Jake you know Scott, Jake? Jake, very well, yeah. Good so friend, he's, yeah. Um, from the sports science course he is, as yeah. well. So yeah. you can see the opportunity on sports journalism and media marketing and PR and sports science. So anyone interested, get your applications in because the <laughs> career path is there. Um, right, well, over to Rebecca to Thanks wrap up much. the event. Thank you, yeah, and I would say that as well. You know, join us. It doesn't matter how old you are. Many of our students are over 30, so, you know, please join us. Great fun, great fun. <laughs> These days, over 30 is called a mature student, which makes most of us here kind of rather extra mature, really, doesn't it? <laughs> Anyway, wow, what a fantastic evening. I mean, I'm sorry to have to draw it to a close, really, because I know you'd like to carry on listening. And you have such a trove of stories and memories, and they land with everybody, and it's just wonderful on. to see. <laughs> <laughs> Mick is going to be outside to yeah, have course, chats yeah. with you and photos and things like that, which we're really grateful to him uh, for doing because it's quite a facing, you know, and it's quite, and it's late, <laughs> but, you know, it's great that you said you'll do that, Mick. So, first of all, I'd just like to thank our panel. Can we give them a nice round of applause? Brilliant. for coming as well. It's great to see so many people here this evening. But finally, a really, really big thank you to Mick for your generosity this evening. It is fantastic. So, big round of applause.